Hello, this is Julia Whitup, and we have with us this morning on our author school show, Lori Flacler, I think. <laughs> I'm not saying, and she's going to be talking to us about how to be a best selling author. So, Lori, tell us how to do that. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here with you, Julia. There are different strategies that best-selling authors use to maintain the best-selling status. And uh, in the olden days, I think people used to think, wow, that book is a bestseller. It must be a great book. I'm going to run out and buy it. And times have changed. Uh, a lot of really, really great books are not achieving best-selling status, and sometimes we pick up bestsellers and we're like, hmm, that might not be the best book I've ever read. Um, what I'm here to share today is some st are some strategies that I would recommend that people use to attain best-selling status. Okay, great. That's what we all want. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing that I recommend for people is that they know their audience. It's very important to understand who they are, um, what their challenges are, what their life is like, what they want, what are their desires, what are the things that, that are holding them back from reaching their goals. Not just their goals, but, but what, are those, what are the hurdles that they have to jump? And then from the author's point of view, what do they actually have to offer them that they could use that's going to further them in their journey? So it's really looking first at the um, audience out there that you want to write for and then really looking at what am I bringing to the table that's going to be so new and so different and so maybe a different point of view or um, a different... Di different advice, you know, different perspective. So looking at that and understanding how we can take our information and deliver that information in a way that the readers can accept it. So that's the first thing is really understanding those readers. And often when I'm reading a book or even reviewing a book for a potential client, I'm always thinking exactly who is this person that this book is written for? Mm -hmm. And I try to create a picture in my mind of who they are. And the next part of that is I try to kind of imagine walking through their daily life. Imagine the things that they're going through and what, they're, what is happening. And then I kind of work back to see how well that reader, that author is, is addressing the needs of that reader. The other thing that's really interesting uh, is to understand that the reader might not be a primary audience. So that's another thing that we always, as authors and marketers, need to take into consideration. Many books are purchased by corporations for uh, people in, that are maybe at a speaking engagement or a training session, and we need to understand the person that, had, that is in charge of the purchase might not be the reader. So we need to make a, take that into account. Also, children's books. Children, yes, that's the reader, but that's not the primary audience. The primary audience would be the parent, the grandparent, mm -hmm. the aunt, the uncle, or maybe the friend. That's it's people purchasing who buy that. the book. Yeah, that would be buying the book. So there we would have the end user that we had to address the needs of, but we also need to look at the, that primary purchaser, that primary audience that we want to attract. And often if we understand what their goals are for the reader, then we're able to really um, write a book that not only addresses what the reader likes and what the reader is interested in, but what that primary audience is interested in. And that's also the same thing in corporations. If we think about what is a corporation actually trying to get their employees or their, um, their customers or their vendors or whatever it is that we're able to supply, what message are they trying to deliver to 
their audience and we're able to supply that, help them, move them forward and supply information to them that moves the needle, chances are we'll be able to sell our book in bulk to those organizations. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing is to understand maybe your book could be a great gift. And if it's a gift, it clearly is not intended for the audience that's purchasing it. It's going to be handed over and handed out. So we need to understand what somebody who's purchasing a gift, what they're really trying to do with that book. Yeah. So, yeah, if we take that into consideration, we'll be much further ahead in potentially selling gift books. Another thing is textbooks. You know, it used to be back in the day, you know, textbooks were very cut and dry and very thick. And, you know, people, you went to school and you got, you bought a textbook for each one of your courses. Well, that's changed dramatically. In the last several years, instructors are thinking more long term. They're thinking not necessarily about delivering information that was written 10, 15 years ago. They're thinking about delivering information that was written, you know, four months, five months ago, a year ago. So what they're able, oh, there's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> she, um, she wants to get on the call. But uh, anyway, what, what we're looking at with this is we're looking at how we can take information that's new, that's hot, that's valuable, something that, that um, an instructor would want to deliver to a class, and maybe what we can do is deliver that information for the instructor in our own words. And often, what we have to take into consideration is the instructor is the one who chooses, the bookstore is the one who purchases, and the student is the end user. So we need to make sure that it, we're, we're moving through the channels with that and understanding how that channel is, you know, and we have to address the needs of each one of the people in that channel, each group. And once and, you've, okay, go ahead. Go, no, 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 go ahead. Well, once you've, uh, you've covered all that, then how do you let them know it, that you've written it? Well, often you could start with your local colleges. Because that's going to be always with marketing, you start locally. Because if you can address the needs locally, you, it's much easier, it's much quicker. Maybe you have a relationship with someone at that local college. Like around us, I live in St. Paul, there's probably 20 different colleges that if I wrote a textbook or a book that could be used, maybe an entrepreneurial book, and people have, people have asked me, why don't you write a book specifically for colleges about how to sell books? about how to be an entrepreneur. I just, you know, yeah. you know, like people haven't gotten around to it. But some people, they actually, their material actually would lend very well to that. So I would say start with relationships or developing relationships in your immediate area that will move you forward with that. I think the, the mistake that most people make in marketing is they think, well, Columbia University probably sells lots of books. So why don't I start there? And that, as a marketer, that's never um, the best way to go about it, unless, in fact, you have those relationships already developed, and then I say go for it. The other thing is find out what those courses are teaching and how your material might fit in, might sync up. So it's, it's, uh, my suggestion is always do a little bit of research prior to writing that book, prior to uh, trying to address a market, again, I'll go back to the audience, understanding those audiences' needs, and then moving forward with that. Right. Another thing is bookstores are not necessarily the best place to try to sell books. So um, when we consider that 75% of all books are sold outside of bookstores, we really need to think outside the box at outlets for um, for delivering our books. So, for instance, I'm going to talk in a, in a little a little bit about this, but um, understanding that other retail establishments are really great places to sell books. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that we need to expand our thinking, get wide in our scope, and then be able to address the needs 
of people in different ways. Understanding that a lot of books are sold when people aren't even shopping for books. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Because now, if you want a book, most of the time, the first place you're going to go is Amazon. But if we look through our daily life, how many times do we buy books outside of Amazon? When I go to, to FedEx Kinko's, they have a whole rack of business books. I peruse that rack. Sometimes I pick up a book. When I go to, even sometimes at the supermarket, I'll see a small book on a rack and I'll say, oh, that looks like something that I would like to read. You see books all over the place. You go to the salon and the hairdresser says, oh, you know what? I just read the most fabulous book. Have you heard of it? No. Well, I have it over here for sale. All right, I'll take it. <laughs> so it's thinking outside the box. Thinking outside the box. And also understanding. So that's actually more about sales than it is about marketing. Because if we take into consideration that marketing is really letting people know about your book. I have a great story. Great story. I met this guy recently because I was listening to a podcast about book marketing. It's like my world, book marketing. So I uh, was listening to this podcast, John Kremer's podcast, and I was listening to this author named Gary, Golds Gary Goldstein. Yeah. And he wrote a book, Jew in Jail. And I was like, wow, that's a really catchy title. So he started talking about how he markets his book. And I was like, okay, I'm listening because this is, this is good. Yeah. It's, the story specifically is about how he ended up going to prison and why he went to prison was through addiction and, um, and robbery and, uh, and how he's, you know, clean and, uh, you know, recovering and, and all that. And what he has done is he, ta he bought a prison outfit and he takes his book and some bookmarks and business cards and when they have a high profile case in New York he goes out and stands outside the courthouse in his prison outfit and he hands out bookmarks and he talks to people well the media of course comes over to find out what this guy is doing in this prison suit there he goes on TV in his prison outfit he does his speaking engagements in his prison outfit and when we look at it I mean, that's really the way to go about doing it. He has a story. He wants people to know about his story. And what he does is he positions himself as a visual representation of his story. So this way people are interested, they're intrigued, they want to know more. One of the interesting things about his story, when I, when I really broke down his story, his story has many different facets as all of our stories do. And his story could work for the Jewish population. He can speak to, to Jewish groups, Jewish community centers, things like that. He can speak to groups in recovery. He can speak to um, people who have gotten out of prison or also um, people who are interested in that. He absolutely has a story for the legal beagles. And the next part of it is he was a journalist so he has a media-friendly story and also understands writing because of that. So he writes articles and things like that. So, I mean, when we look at it, these stories, there's so many different stories that we have. Best-selling authors understand their stories and they're able to deliver those stories in a way that ingratiate the media to them make um, the audience interested in this story, make it memorable, set them apart from other people who have written books, because we all know there's like a million plus books written every year and published. Many of those books are self-published authors. Many of those books we really don't even hear about or know about. What makes us stand out from the crowd? What makes us stand out from all of those million books that are, that are produced? Well, it's our stories. So when we understand that story and how we're getting that story out and we attach the right story and, and really enter the conversation with the right story for the audience, 
So it's like a mix and match of our stories. We create those stories beforehand and we have them at bay that we're able to deliver to the audience we're speaking with. And that way we own a place in that audience's mind with our story. Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah, that's that's ingenious. <laughs> what other bright ideas do you have? <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, I work with this stuff all the time. One of the things that I think is really important, let me tell you another story. Okay. I had a client that came to me, and he was, um, he had done a five-year study, and he studied 268 wealthy people and 160-some, um, I think 167 poor people. And he studied them for five years, and he studied over 200 of their daily habits. So um, when he came to me, he had his book. It took him about a year to write his book and get it published. Then he was marketing his book, and in the three years since he had his book, he had a 1,000 books that he had sold. Interesting fact about this is 500 books were sold to one person. So in his efforts of speaking and media and radio and everything, he sold actually on his own 501, the way that I look at it, 501 books, which turned out to be a thousand. So we, when we started working together right away, I knew we had an issue. We needed rebranding. We needed revamping. We needed a new website. We absolutely needed a story and we needed a repositioning of Tom because Tom, and he considered himself at that time, so I'm not saying something negative about him, to be a very ordinary accountant. He was, he owned an accounting firm, still does, but he spent most of his days checks and numbers and, you know, doing his little accounting deal. And um, after he wrote this book, all he wanted to do was just continue writing. So his goal we, which we established was to sell a hundred thousand books and to leave his accounting kind of in the wake of and and move into full time writing. So we started on February twenty seventh, two thousand and twelve, and I kept saying to Tom, Tom, there's a story. We I had never met him. We were working via Skype. Tom was in New York, and I'm in Minnesota. Tom, there's a story, and no, 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 there's no story. Tom. There's got to be a story behind this. No, 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 there's no story. So finally in April, one Saturday morning in April, he told me, he's like, yes, there's a story. And I said, what's the story? So he tells me the story. I'm like, Tom, that's the story. That is the story we need. I knew there was a story. That's the story. Why were you reluctant to tell the story? He said, I was reluctant to tell the story because I didn't want to hurt my father's feelings. And he said, I thought if I told this story, I would make my father look bad. I said, well, why don't you speak to your father and find out what he thinks about you telling his story? So the next week I talked to him and he says, you know what, I talked to my father. My father says, absolutely, if you think you can help people telling my story, please tell my story. So the first media that Tom got, which was like the following week, big media, Tom told the story. And the story actually was the first and most important thing that he had done with the media. And every media interview that he's had since, the first thing that they talk about is Tom's story. So Tom's story really has set him apart from everyone else out there. He's the only one I've ever heard of with this particular story. So let me give you a little insight into the story. Okay. (laughs) We're dying to know. (laughs) (laughs) Tom's story is... He grew up in a very, very wealthy household. They belonged to the number one country club. They lived in the nicest area in Staten Island. His father was very, very successful. And one night when he was nine years old, he went to sleep. And the next morning he woke up and they were poor. During the night, his father's businesses were all in a central location. There was an explosion and all of his businesses were burnt down. One night. So... He went, his father tried to recover and could not recover. And when he was in uh, college, he 
he was the valet at the country club that he used to belong to. How embarrassing, right? Mm. He worked his way through college as a janitor. You know, all of all of his life when he was growing up, there were like eight brothers and sisters. Everybody was working just to keep the family going. So he had a paper route. He had this. He had that. He'd bring his money home and he'd give the money to his parents so they could keep the household going. The father was able to maintain the house, but basically everything else was gone. So he went from living in this to being in this really wealthy environment, having been wealthy, to then being poor. So um, anyway, when he told that story, he got on Yahoo Financially Fit, and we got 2.2 million hits on his video wow. the first 24 hours, which launched Tom to be a best-selling author. So Tom is a best-selling author of Rich Habits. And we have gone on to get Tom in Success Magazine. He was in Success Magazine and in, in November 2014. And he was on the CD. And he came out in Darren Hardy's private blog. And um, he has also written a second book, which is Rich Kids, which is a phenomenal book. This is an excellent, excellent book. Everyone with children should get this book. It's a great book. Um, so his Rich Habits book, we've been working together for two years, and his Rich Habits book is now sold 25,000 copies. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He's if almost check, reached his goal. Yeah, yeah, we're working towards that goal. I was actually on with him this morning because we're going to do an article and pitch that about um, Dr. Stanley's death, The Millionaire Next Door. Mm -hmm. He recently was uh, was killed in a car accident, tragic, tragic death. But we're going to pitch the media about that because Tom actually had spoken to um, to him uh, years ago and also was following him and and considered him a bit of um, not necessarily a mentor, but somebody who uh, Tom kind of followed in his footsteps with his book. So um, even though the Rich Habits was written before. Before Tom came in contact with him, still the research and things like that. So um, anyway, Tom is now an internationally recognized uh, author. And if you go to his website, which is richhabits.net, you can see the plethora of um, media that Tom has gotten. Right now we're waiting for an article, article to come out in a magazine in Brazil. And... Um, we're expecting that that magazine is going to be an amazing, amazing. Oh, he was also in Money Magazine. I mean, he's been he's been all over. He's a um, contributor for uh, Business Insider, and now he's going to be a contributor for Credit.com. When his article came out, an article written about him by Jerry Dutchweiler, who's the director of Credit.com, when that article came out, he got fifty eight thousand hits on his website in twenty four hours. Wow. When that came uh, yeah, in MSN.com. So that's one of the stories. Another story I have oh, is Lori, about... Oh, Lori, we're about out of time. So <laughs> could you tell us, uh, give us some contact information, how people could get a hold of you? Sure. Um, my uh, email is Lori at successwithsoltar.com. And Soltar is spelled S-A-L-T-A-R. And right now, I have an, um, a really great offer that's going on. I'm teaching a book marketing and media training retreat in, on May, starting May 3rd through the 7th, and it's in the Dominican Republic, and it's also a one-year program that I take clients through all of the things that I teach. I give them the foundation in the Dominican Republic in that first five days, and then I work with them for the rest of the year. We have guided mastermind calls every two weeks. It's a great opportunity, not just to get to be a bestseller, but to actually sell books. Great. So people can check that okay, out. Okay, and we're going to have you as a resource um, member on our website, correct? Absolutely. Okay, and, and I want to invite you to write a uh, guest article for our blog. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You can see out on LinkedIn as well. Okay, thank you so much for being with us. 
Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.